Sorry. So, bonjour David. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, today is all courtesy of Frank. He's arranged everything today. So, I'm going to sit back for once and hand over to Frank and let him take the reins today. Okay. Thanks, Soren. So, uh, I'm glad to, to introduce you to with Dave, David, David Roussier. Uh, he's the distillery manager at uh, Distillery Varangem in Brittany. Um, is, uh, this distillery uh, is, well, I I'll let uh, da David uh, tell you about <laughs> the distillery, but uh, it's uh, the first distillery in France who has ever made uh, a French whiskey, 100% uh, French whiskey. That was uh, 25 years ago, I believe. Uh, maybe I should uh, show you where is situated the distillery in France. So I hope you can see. Okay, that's so, it there. The distillery is <laughs> there in Manu. Uh, at first, I was seeing the Swiss, oh. so I was wondering. <laughs> when, uh... Hey, guys. Hello, Ed. Okay, so um, uh, David, maybe you can introduce uh, yourself and uh, tell us about uh, Distillery Varangem. Yeah, yeah, sure. So thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Um, I'm usually not too fond of uh, these uh, video things, but uh, I, I guess I was really happy to, you know, have the possibility to speak to some uh, whiskey aficionados because <laughs> I'm actually missing uh, going on shows and tours and so on. So thank you very much. Um, if if you if you'd like, uh, maybe um, I can make a little bit of introduction, uh, the general context of the distillery, and then I'll let you you know fire as many questions as you want. Uh, I think it's, it might be easier this way. Yep. Um, so uh, again, I'm I'm David Rouchier. Uh, I'm managing the distillery Varangem, which is uh, making uh, Armoric uh, single malt whiskey, and uh, it's a it's a family business. Uh, it was uh, created in 1900 by a, a guy who came from the north of France. Uh, that's why we have um, that uh, Flemish uh, name Varangem. Mm. Uh, so they settled in Brittany and they decided to create a distillery for uh, making uh, liqueurs, you know, like plant and herb uh, liqueurs. Uh, the first product of the, of the distillery was actually a bit like uh, Chartreuse, you know, this kind, of, uh, this kind of spirits. So for 80 years, we were making only these uh, local liqueurs, uh, only for the Britain market. And uh, in 1981, my father-in-law joined the company. And at that time, the liquor business was not doing very well. Uh, people had, in France had pretty much stopped uh, drinking liquors. So he had to find new ideas to save the business. And he decided to go for um, a very uh, local product. So we started with mead. Uh, we call it in, in Brittany, we call it Shushen. It's, uh, you know, very, very typical from Brittany. We don't, we hardly sell any bottle further than Rennes. Uh, so even in France, we don't drink, uh, uh, we don't drink mead. Uh, and then, so he went into mead, he went into um, apple, apple products. You know, Brittany is famous for uh, ciders, cider brandy and so on. So he also decided to bottle these kind of things. And in 1983, he, he, the most important thing is he decided to create uh, the first whiskey distillery in France. Um, so the idea, there were two main reasons why he, he did that. Uh, first reason is um, France has always been the, one of the biggest market in the world for, uh, for Scotch whiskey. So you know, it kind of makes sense when you want to find uh, a, new product for the future of the distillery, it makes sense to uh, start 
with the, the most uh, successful product in, in France. So uh, that, that's whiskey. And the second thing is, um, in, I think it was in 1982 or 1983, uh, we have that uh, on 14th of July, we have that uh, garden party at the Elysee with the French president and so on. And there was a so-called French whiskey at that time that was served to the president and the journalists were actually quite, quite fond of the idea and he decided to, yeah, not. I mean, if, if that can get that much interest, then maybe there is a market for that. Uh, because actually the product that was served these days was not uh, entirely French, it was uh, Scotch whiskey bottled in France. Um, so he decided that day that he would definitely uh, create the first French distillery. So he went to Scotland quite a few times. Uh, he started distilling in 1983. And in 1987, we launched a blend, blended whiskey called WB. Um, it's a yeah, cheap uh, blend, uh, pretty much like you know, uh, what you would expect from a Johnny Walker or, or things like that. Uh, and it actually worked quite well in Brittany because uh, in Brittany we're uh, very uh, chauvin, je sais pas, for the French speakers. You know, very proud of what we produce ourselves. Let's say that. Uh, so um, it worked quite well. And uh, in 1993, uh, he built a distillery dedicated to whiskey. Before that, we were using the old still we had for uh, making liqueurs. And in 1993, we really we bought uh, pot stills, copper pot stills, and we settled a distillery only for, uh, for whiskey making. And four years later, we launched Armoric, uh, the first French single malt. So yeah, that's the, that's the general context. So I, I mean, speaking for myself, I joined the company 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago. Um, at first I was not very, you know, uh, uh, I, I didn't know a lot about the whiskey business. Uh, I was in the finance business. Sorry about that. Uh, but then I had the opportunity to join the family business and um, I started uh, taking care of the export market. So I went to different shows all over Europe and, you know, in maybe not even six months, I started to really get more and more uh, passionate about whiskey. And then and then I, you know, I continued uh, running the distillery. We also had the chance to work with uh, Jim Swan uh, at some point uh, in the uh, 2011, I guess. And yeah, that's that's how we we came to to today, I guess. So on that sort of note, what would you say? The distillery profile is for the whiskey. How would you describe your profile? So the um, uh, actually, like I just said, we when we worked with uh, Jim Swan in 2010, 11, 12, uh, the idea was to really define and uh, make sure that Armorica has its own profile. Before that, we were distilling, but I don't think you can really say there was a specific profile to Armoric. The consistency was not really there. So really in, in, with Jim, we, we decided to, to, to set a, a profile for Armoric. And uh, the, the profile we've decided to go on is um, very fruity. We wanted the very, very fruity whiskey. And also we wanted to something that's very uh, rich and oily. I mean, oily may be a wrong term, but uh, uh, creamy maybe is better. So let's say uh, fruity, rich, and creamy. That's that's where we're going. And from what I've seen from your web page and, and the whiskies that I've seen released from you, it seems that you use probably bourbon casks and a lot of sherry casks. Thinking the fact that you're from France, one would immediately expect wine casks. Do you have many wine casks or is it a predominantly sherry bourbon type of maturation? 
Um, so it, it, again, that, that has changed over the years. Uh, when we started in the early uh, 80s, the idea at that time was to make sure that our whiskey would taste like the Scotch whiskey. And even when I joined the company uh, 10 years ago, when, you, when I first went on shows in, uh, on the European market, people were actually, they, they, they were expecting Armoric to taste a bit like the Scotch. They didn't want us to be different. So um, that, that's the reason why when he built the distillery, when he started the business, my father-in-law was very, very influenced by the Scotch. Uh, we, we are one of the only distillery who has uh, proper uh, pot stills, like the one you see in Scotland. We don't use the cognac stills or, or the, the other type of stills we have in France. And that's also why we use mainly uh, bourbon cask, sherry or rosso cask. So um, maybe 60% of the warehouse is uh, bourbon cask that we get directly from Kentucky. Then we have a partnership with um, the Bodega uh, Jose Miguel Martin uh, for the for the Oloroso Sherry Cask. And uh, what we've done in the last 20 years is we uh, built a um, partnership also with a local cooper in Brittany. Uh, we have uh, a, this guy in Douarnenez, Jean-Baptiste Lefloc is uh, selecting trees in the local forest in Brittany and he makes cask uh, especially for us. So that's the third type of cask. You can actually taste uh, the benefits of the Britain oak cask in the double maturation that uh, Franck was uh, mm. showing around earlier. And nowadays, uh, things are changing a bit and uh, people expect us to, you know, make it a little more French. So we are uh, indeed uh, buying more and more wine cask, but you know it's always a bit tricky to to use. So mm. sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So, and what what benefits do you find from using your local oak from the casks? Is is it a softer oak, or uh, what type of oak is it that you are using from Brittany then? Yeah, it, it's a uh, uh, we call it fine fine grain, so very. Uh, uh, tight kind of uh, oak and uh, the good thing is we 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 use them uh, like uh, uh, I mean new oak completely new They're, they have never seen anything else before uh, in the cask and um, they have very very uh, low uh, tannins I mean compared to what you would expect from uh, let's say limousin oak uh, we have a very, very low tannins level, so it doesn't give that, um, uh, it gives a structure to the, to the whiskey, it gives a little bit of sweetness as well, but it doesn't uh, become too powerful and too woody, uh, like, like when you use other, you know, fresh casks. Is it, David, is it that, um, I think uh, you often get sort of like a really quite kind of bready character from from European oak is it is it sort of like that uh, yeah yeah I mean we, we have this uh, kind of yeah, bready character but uh, oh that's a nice picture that's nice um, but uh, the thing is we we try not to uh, put the whiskey too long in the, in the cask, otherwise the, the, the wood uh, tends to overpower the, the, the aroma. You want the spirit to shine through. Yeah, yeah. That just a character. We, we want to have the, the, the character of the spirit in, in, the, in the bottle, of course. That's, that's the main thing. Why is, it a, why is the, um, the whiskey called Amaric? Uh, Armoric is the, the Roman name of uh, Brittany. If you look uh, at, for, for say, uh, Asterix and Obelix, for example, um, they live in Armorica, which was the Roman name of Brittany at that time. And uh, now we have the, um, the National Park uh, of Armoric. Uh, and uh, we decided it was a good name. Uh, it's, it's quite easy to pronounce in many languages. and. Um, it immediately gives you an idea where the whiskey is from. Uh, 
and that was very important to us. So, I mean, one thing I noticed that you've obviously got more than one name of whiskey coming out of the distillery. Is there any reason for that? Yeah, we again we're uh, we're uh, making the making it the the, the Scottish way. Uh, we have our single malt, which is called Armoric, and uh, the. the the official name of the single malt is Armoric. But then for the blends, we use all the names. Uh, we have the WB, uh, we have the Galeg, we have the Braise Whiskey. Uh, because, I mean, some distilleries in France, they have the, the same names for both their single malt, their blends. And I think uh, it, it may be better if, uh, I mean, it makes it easier for people to understand that Armoric is a single malt and for example, braise is a blend, and uh, there are two different things. So that was the idea. Uh, we're actually planning to no launch a new uh, name, a new whiskey uh, that would be for uh, September. And it's, it's not going to be called Armoric because the profile and uh, the aromas will be completely different. Yeah. And is everything the name of that? Sorry? Hi, David. What's going to be the name of that? <laughs> uh, it's the, the a secret. The, no, no, no. It's not secret. It, okay. I'm actually working on the packaging right now. It's it, it will be called uh, Yonelez. Uh, Yonelez is uh, the the ancient uh, peat bog uh, right in the middle of the national park of Armoric. Ah, okay, That's thank you. And so, is that going to be peated then? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And is that your first peat from the region? With peat from the from the region? No, unfortunately not. The 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 peat bogs in uh, in France they are all uh, protected. You you're not allowed. Oh, to that's a shame. shame. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, and um, we actually it was an experiment we did like six years ago uh, we wanted to try distilling a little bit of peat just you know for fun yeah. and um, and we did something that was quite nice we uh, we bought the the barley from from scotland uh, we worked with uh, chris maltings uh, so that's scottish peat scottish barley uh, but then it's distilled at the distillery and um, quite nice Quite nice. I am looking forward to the to the launch of the whiskey. How long are you planning to um, do a, a peated run each year? So we... uh, for for the last uh, four five years, we've been distilling one full truck every year. So that's uh, twenty six tons. So we have uh, the maximum capacity in, in you know peated uh, whiskey will be around uh, 25,000 bottles a year. But, you know, but at, for the moment, it's just, a, it, it's going to be a side thing. Uh, Armoric will remain the main, uh, the main whiskey. And what is your capacity at the distillery for producing whiskey per year? So, um, right now we are up to 160,000 liter of pure alcohol. But the total capacity, if uh, we were to run 24-7, uh, we would go up to 400,000. Uh, 400, right, so it's, it's quite a big jump then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, we, we still have a lot of uh, capacity available. But uh, as you can, I mean, it's, it's hard to uh, uh, see that from the pictures, but our stills are, are quite big. Uh, the... the, the the wash still is 6,000 liters. The one at the back on this picture, this one, um, it's 6,000 liters. So it's, it's a pretty big still for a small distillery like yeah. we are. Yeah. And what percentage of the whiskey you make goes into your, your liqueurs then? Sorry? So you, you make liqueurs as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah, still. Yeah. So what percentage of the whiskey goes into the liqueurs? We, we don't, uh, we, we just have one liqueur uh, using whiskey in it. Yeah. It's, it's the Elixir d'Armoric, uh, yeah. where we use uh, whiskey, plants, and honey. But it's just, uh, I mean, Elixir d'Armoric is 
maybe 4,000 bottles a year. Uh, so, so it's only a very small run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's very small. But, I mean, whiskey has become the, the main uh, activity of the distillery. We're uh, now, uh, I think last year there was 71% of the business was about whiskey. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Vim, I think Vim had a pretty interesting question. Do you want to ask that now, Vim? Still there? Well, it's perhaps a bit of a strange question, but I know several years ago, Glenar Moore had a problem with the French authorities about uh, naming whiskey, Brit uh, Brittany whiskey on the labels. Have you had that problem too, or do you avoid that by using whiskey Breton? No. Um, <laughs> uh, to, to be completely honest, I might be uh, one of the reason he had problem. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I, I know. I know it was pretty awkward several years ago for yeah. Glenamore. Uh, 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 they, um, they had a big dispute uh, about that, I believe, and uh, I even think they almost were forced to close on the issue. Uh, so, because of the confusion with uh, Great Britain and uh, the French Brittany region, uh, putting that on a label, but no, perhaps no. you haven't had the problem. No, no, the, the things, the, the whole story, it, it actually started in uh, 2009. You know, France is quite famous for AOCs and uh, IG. So, uh, we have AOCs for wine, cognac, and so on, and we have appellation the... controlé. Sorry. So in That's English, it would be controlé. yeah. In English, it would be PGI, protected geographical indication. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. I didn't know <laughs> for non-French speakers. <laughs> With so, a AOC is the really uh, very very strict thing, and then uh, PGI is a little less strict. Uh, and in 2009, all the Britain whiskey producer, including Glana Moore, we met and the idea was to, uh, was to set up uh, our own uh, PGI. And during that process, uh, there, was, it, there was some issues with, uh, with Glana Moore and we couldn't uh, manage to uh, work together, uh, I would say. Uh, I mean, the, the thing is, if you really want to have their own reason why they're not into that uh, PGI, then it's easier to ask. But uh, the thing is, I think Glen Armour, they wanted to make the PGI only for uh, single malt whiskey, only for 46% so, yeah. uh, yeah. alcohol, only unchill filtered and so on. But the real was at that time that uh, we had, we still had that blended whiskey WB. Uh, other producers, they were making whiskey from buckwheat. So the the idea of the of, of the GI was to be wide enough so all the producers that were distilling whiskey and making whiskey in Brittany they could actually use the actually. name Brittany whiskey. Um, so that's I, I guess that's why uh, Glen Armour didn't want to join at the end. Uh, and the thing is, uh, the law in France is that if you have the GI, then you can use uh, the name Britain Whiskey. If you're not part of the GI, then you can't use uh, Britain Whiskey. Ah, uh, okay. That's clear. Thank you. That, that's not the best thing that arrived, that uh, happened in the whiskey in the Britain whiskey industry. I'm afraid. I know. I know it uh, was quite an issue a couple of years ago. I haven't heard anything from it since, but uh, it's, I'm glad it's solved. Yeah, it, it's solved. I mean, he's. I mean, Jean Donnet uh, has decided to you know stay apart from the GI and. I mean, we're. Uh, it took us a while, but now we're talking to each other. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Regarding the other problem you were talking about, uh, David, are you talking about uh, the age mention? Like in France, we, for what I've heard, uh, I've not uh, verified that, but from what I've heard, 
you may not be able to call your 10 year old 10 year old oh yeah that, that's another issue we have in france <laughs> We, we love to have issues with fans. Yeah, definitely, and stupid rules and so on, but uh, anyway. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, I mean, uh, you know, the spirits, all, all the spirits regulations, they are defined on a European level. And um, in the last uh, spirit law that uh, came out, I think that was 2019, there's a, a tiny little sentence saying that you can't mention the age statement if you don't have, uh, if, your, um, uh, if your maturation process is not followed by a customs administration. And the problem is uh, in France, uh, we consider that the official uh, French customs, they're not, uh, they're not doing that, you know, uh, they, they don't uh, look at your maturation process. So uh, we're not, we, we are not allowed to mention the age statement because no one is making sure the age statement is true. That's as stupid as that. Uh, in Cognac, they can do it because they have their own, um, how you call that, their, uh, the equivalent of the SWA for the Cognac. Uh, they are actually uh, checking the maturation uh, processes so they can use age statement in in the french whiskey and in the britain whiskey we don't have that uh, equivalent of the swa so we are not allowed to mention age statements so I, i've uh, the first year no one saw that i launched uh, armory 10 years old so that was not a problem last year uh, we had a derogation to launch the 10 years old and i think this year we might we won't be able to launch the 10 years old this year because uh, the customs in France are uh, I mean all the administrations in France are busy doing something else than you know taking care of the age statement so can you get around that by putting it down as a vintage uh, we are allowed <laughs> yeah that, that's, <laughs> yeah um, <Right>. <laughs> it's, it's the stupidest law in France we have so it, you have the right to use uh, uh, vintages, and in the law it's written that you you can use vintages as long as you're able to prove it. Yeah, but so you're I, not allowed to do that for age statements. I presume by proving you mean that you can show documentation that that casks were filled that day. So in the argument, then how does that not apply to the age statement? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> No, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's it's completely stupid. But uh, I, I can I can actually launch the Armoy ten years this year just by calling it uh, Armoy two thousand and ten. That yeah. would not be a problem. That would so be basically yeah. If if you put on your bottle distill two thousand and ten bottle two thousand and twenty, you know we we can obviously hopefully do the maths on that one. And but you cannot actually put. Could you, could you get around that by saying matured for 10 years? Or can you just not put an age on there, full stop? No, you're, you're, you're not allowed to, to mention the age. Uh, the only, there's a tiny little difference actually. Uh, if you want to write uh, distilled in 2010, bottled in 2020, you have to have 100% of the whiskey distilled yeah. in 2010. Mm -hmm. If you write 10 years old, it means that you can use a bit of yeah, anything, yeah. old, a bit of 11 years old so yeah it's a little different uh but yeah we, we might get around the the, the the age statement thing by just writing on the label uh this till 2010 uh, we will we'll just change the batting yeah. So yeah i love the fact that um that you're basically being regulated because there isn't anyone to regulate you <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's kind of crazy. You could, you could say it like this way, yeah. <laughs> and I have a question about your uh, your stills. Um, uh, first of all, um, were they made for you, uh, and who by? And if not, where did you get them? Um, and second, um, I think it was your uh, your wash still has the has the boiling ball on the neck, whereas the the spirit is kind of more of a, a straight neck. Um, obviously, that's kind of to do with copper contact, but do you, do you want to talk about that? 
Yeah, um, so both the steels, they were made in cognac uh, by the local coopers uh, we have uh, in the area, but they were uh, designed uh, by my father-in-law and a Scottish engineer at that time. So and the idea is, I mean, <laughs> there's no real reason why they have uh, this shape or the expansion bowl. The thing is, my father-in-law visited distilleries and uh, he had, you know, some whiskies he liked and he kind of copied the, the shape of the stills uh, from the distillery he actually enjoyed. So that, that's how we came to have these uh, stills and, and, and this shape. Um, uh, a funny story about the, our stills, uh, I was talking about uh, Jim Swan, uh, so in, he came in uh, in 2010 uh, to help us make that armoric style and at that time when he came, the line, both the line arms, they were going up. Yes. Yeah. Because my father-in-law at that time, he was not so sure of the, the mashing part and the fermentation, so he wanted to increase the reflux. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a lot of work with Jim uh, on the, the, the mashing, uh, we changed the, the yeast, we changed the fermentation time, we changed quite a lot of things. And we finally get to the profile we were expecting, but the line arm was still going up. And I, I still remember Jim telling me that it would be great to see the, um, the, the stills and to taste the distillates that would come out of the stills. Uh, like they were meant, uh, you know, to be. So we decided to put the line arms down and they never went up again. Uh, because we have that richness, that uh, creaminess that comes from, you know, the original <laughs> shape of the stills. Yeah, it's a bit heavier spirit. Brilliant, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, in terms of the blends that you do, do you source all the other whiskies within France or do you go further afield? No, we, we actually distill uh, the grain whiskey ourselves in pot stills as well. And we, what, what, sorry, what grain do you use then? Is that a wheat or do you use corn? Yeah, that's wheat. That we, we buy wheat from Brittany itself and yep. uh, we, we distill it in the pot stills. Uh, we, we, we will try, we have a small column still for the side of brandy and we might uh, try to use it uh, to distill the uh, grain whiskey also, but for the moment uh, we do blended whiskies, hundred percent pot stills. Do you, do you plan to use other grains like uh, maize or I hope not buckwheat, but uh, like maize maybe? <laughs> uh, we have tried quite a few things. Uh, I don't think maize, we, we tried it. Uh, we have tried uh, rye. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, do sell, uh, you do sell rye at uh, the distillery. Yeah. Um, don't remember the name right now, but uh, Frank did show a, a picture inside the distillery. Uh, That's it's, called, it's, called, uh, it's called the Hoof High. Mm, yeah, and that's something we we distilled uh, in Brittany, and we mature it a little bit uh, around uh, Marseille. Uh, uh, we have tried we have tried buckwheat, but we're not convinced. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I really wouldn't disagree with that. <laughs> uh, I mean, our good friends at the distillery des Menir, they they do it uh, very well, so there's no need. To do exactly the same. <laughs> Did you mention, David, that buckwheat is a, a traditional style? Tra uh, I mean, buckwheat is traditional in, in Brittany. Yeah. But, um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's traditional in whiskey. I mean, they, they, I know only one distillery yeah. uh, in buckwheat. Uh, yeah. And it's quite different, really, really different uh, than I'd say any other whiskey. Uh, really a different profile to it. So listening to the amount of rules and regulations you've got on age things and that, um, 
how I, I presume you go to European law for the wood for the cask. So can you use anything other than oak or do you just stick to the oak? Um, we decide, in Brittany for the GI uh, whiskey Breton, we decide to go only for oak. Right. I mean, some some people might uh, think it's a shame, but it was the just the uh, the the reality in Brittany. No one was using anything else at that time, so that that's how uh, we decide to stick to to oak. But there's a lot of things to do with oak, yeah. especially well, if you count yeah. on the wine the, the wine cask and so on. Well, what I was going to sort of the next sort of movement to that one is obviously you are producing cider as well. So have you thought of, uh, are you already doing it, whiskey into the cider casks? There's, obviously there's been a lot of controversy in Scotland with one of the distilleries doing that, but obviously you, in theory, I suppose, can do that. Uh, we don't produce cider ourselves uh, at the distillery. Uh, we, we just uh, distill cider to make uh, cider brandy. So we have some whiskies uh, maturing in cider brandy cask. Uh, they're still, uh, maturing. Uh, but there's, a, there's another uh, Britain whiskey producer, called, a very small one called uh, Nagelan, and he's, uh, he has uh, bought some, some, some whiskey from us, and he's maturing it in, uh, in, in cider cask, and it, it's actually quite good. I mean, it makes a, an, another profile, uh, very interesting, very fruity, but oh, very nice. And uh, what we've done at the distillery is, uh, uh, I think that was three or four years ago, we decided to put our whiskey in all the different type of casks we had, uh, you know, in-house. So cider brandy cask, uh, pomo de Bretagne cask, uh, mead casks. And uh, actually mead cask might sound funny, uh, but uh, we, we bottled one for, uh, for La Maison du Whisky, I think that was two or three years ago, and that was actually very, very uh, nicely received. And so in theory, when could we maybe see a uh, whisky either finished or matured inside a brandy cask then? Well, if, if you come to the distillery, uh, once, once you're allowed to, to come, <laughs> uh, I, can, I can have a, a taste for you. That's the vino cask. Yes. That's the vino cask. Yeah, the wonderful whiskey. Yes. When we're talking about cider brandy, we're talking Calvados. Yes. Yes, that's uh, pretty much the same thing. Just Calvados is uh, AOC from uh, Normandy, and uh, cider brandy in Brittany is called Fin Bretagne. Ah, brilliant. So again, you, you look to kind of source locally, like like you've done before. Yeah. So these are all the, the secret casks we have not yet bottled. No longer secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, those, those pictures. Uh, Giving the those, game away. <laughs> those pictures were taken uh, in uh, August last year. Okay. Uh, by the way, so, oh, some of them are really blurry because they were uh, too high for my... Uh, Camera, but because what you is Savonnier? Savonnier, Savonnier is a um, is a wine from the Loire Valley. Uh, oh, okay. it's, it's, it's an AOC. It's hundred percent Chenin, and um, it so far uh, it, it it's gonna it's quite nice. It's very very nice. I mean, Chenin is a, is a white uh, wine, yep. which is very very full bodied and uh, very aromatic. And it goes very, very well with uh, our uh, fruity uh, armoric. Th these are rum casks. Uh, which can, you, can you tell us from uh, which distillery you bought the rum cask uh, to, from? Uh, I, I don't know the original distillery. I, I bought these casks from um, Les Rhum de Cède. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know. Uh, I, I just don't know where they buy the casks, but uh, that would be rum from uh, Martinique. Okay. And we uh, have Mai. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Mai is the name of the producer. He's, uh, he's oh, okay. <laughs> making a company, uh, wine, actually. Okay. But yes, I, I've seen uh, some of the uh, comments, but a cider brandy. 
uh, whiskey. Uh, I, I don't know when we will bottle it, but uh, for sure we will do uh, because it, it's it's actually working quite well. I'm waiting uh, for this one. <laughs> there's other, what proportion <laughs> focuses on new core expression? That's it. And how much can you use for experimenting? Uh, that's the, the idea of uh, the range armoric is we have uh, three core expressions. Uh, classic, which is uh, in bourbon cask. We have the sherry cask in sherry and we have the double maturation, uh, which is using both uh, Britano cask and then sherry. And then we have um, limited editions. We have the 10 years old. Uh, Triagos, which is a lightly peated armoric, and then we have the Derven, which is 100% in uh, virgin Britain oak cask. Uh, and all these casks, you've seen the Savignon, rum, and so on, they are usually bottled for uh, other people, for retailers, for distributors. Um, I don't know if anyone is from Germany, but uh, Germany did Get, got a lot of uh, special single cask from Armwick. Uh, very nice one, port cask, uh, Sauternes cask. Some. Uh, and how some many, of them are, oh, go ahead. Sorry, how many casks have you got maturing at the moment? Um, right now we have up around 5,000, I would say. We have almost, uh, almost six years of uh, stock in of production, the equivalent of production. Going back to the 2002 um, vintage editions, this one is the 14 year old. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> Not this, one. Oh, this one. Uh, so that's the last one to date. Uh, are you uh, planning to to bottle another one? I uh, I, I think the the two thousand two vintages are your old eldest casks in the distillery. Yeah, we we started distilling in nineteen eighty three, but uh, unfortunately we don't have anything uh, older than two thousand two. Uh, the thing is, we were uh, planning to bottle one last year. We wanted to have a you know. Uh, special bottling for the opening of our uh, visitor center. But unfortunately, since we don't have the right to mention the age statement, then so for the moment they stay in the cask. Uh, as soon as I have the right to mention the age statement, we will launch uh, something around uh, that would reach 18 years old now. So that's looking good. But uh, the thing is, if you can't write it on the label, it's it's a shame. Just put something like, it might be 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> might be 10 or more. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, Fiona who was asking, but uh, the our friends from uh, Great Britain can't pronounce that. Uh, any give us Traminer cask? So that again. Coming? Any give us Traminer? Cask. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. Um, so for, for uh, just, a, just a sec, David, uh, for, for the ones who have no idea what I'm talking about, Gewürztraminer uh, is uh, white wine, a little bit sweet uh, from um, Alsace. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, uh, David. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so far we don't have any of these casks. Uh, all, all the casks uh, we have, I mean the French wine cask, all the casks we have are were bought directly from um, from the wine producers, and uh, we could we could uh, ask some uh, cask traders to you know provide us with a different type of cask, but. I think it, 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 it makes more sense if you know the guy uh, who you're buying from. So for the moment, uh, no Alsace cask. Do you do much cask trading then in France between the other distilleries to, to make up your blends or is it basically all in-house? No, uh, we don't have that tradition in France. It's, it's mainly uh, in-house uh, production. 
And also out of the maybe 70 distilleries in France right now, most of the distilleries are making uh, single malts. Mm. You have some, some brands producing uh, blended malts, you know, buying uh, different distilleries, but I think we might be one of the only one making blended whiskey, technically. Yeah. I don't know, Frank or Christophe, if you know other brands making blends. I've but... never heard. No, no neither, uh, neither do I. I, um, I, think, I think the only brands I know uh, selling a French blend, uh, they, I think they import their um, grain whiskey from uh, uh, Germany or uh, Scotland. Yeah. Or maybe... I wonder if Nagelan didn't uh, do a blended, maybe blended malt, uh, yeah. including some of uh, Wanga malt, but maybe from others, I'm, I'm not sure. But I'm, I'm not sure. I have to check on whiskey base, even though uh, yeah. uh, it's far for complete for, for French distilleries, or especially a, a small uh, small one like, uh, like him. But uh, I wonder if Nagelan didn't do... Uh, uh, a French blend. I don't know. I, I think the, the the one who could answer is uh, Philippe Juget. I think he would uh, answer this question. Yeah. But, uh, it's <laughs> difficult to to know because uh, nowadays in France uh, there are about seventy distilleries uh, producing whiskey. Uh, within these seventy distilleries, only I think about forty are now selling whiskey or have uh, spirits older than three years old. But um, it's hard to, to, to follow uh, who's making what. Mm. Um, so what, another question, sort of going back to the cask side, David, um, what, what strength are you putting on you make into casks? And does it vary at all, or is it, is it spot on the same every time? You know, the, the distillate goes into the cask at around approximately uh, 63, 64. We're, we're not very, very uh, precise because we don't, you know, trade the cask. Yeah. But um, we try to remain around 63, 64, 65. Um, not more than that because I, I, I understand that the more... Um, strength in the cask the more you extract from the wood so it might not always be a, a good idea yeah i'm gonna say because i mean my belief is that the the higher the strength in theory the longer the maturation is needed obviously if you bring the strength down a little bit then in theory it can mature a little bit faster but uh, 63 does obviously seem the, the normal sort of strength but it, it, it does seem to have changed a little bit with some distilleries where they're starting to put it in at maybe 68, 69. Some, sometimes it's for warehouse space, things like that for, you know, a few yeah. casks, but it does seem to be altering a little bit. Excuse me, just a second. Not a problem. <laughs> somebody walk out on us. <laughs> People coming in the distillery right now. All right, so you're yes. at the distillery right now. Yeah, I think it's the, it's it's actually the master blender in this family. The, uh, you know, maybe uh, taking some bottles for a, a party there yeah, tonight. Yeah, if you're missing any <laughs> cast, you'll know who it was. <laughs> yeah. we, we should have arranged for a virtual tour, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, would be very I, cool. I was wondering how many of you guys already tasted our week? I haven't. I'd, I'd like to at some point. Not have the pleasure. I yeah. have. Okay. John, I think John is uh, uh, has a, a sample in his glass now. John? I have. I, I'm actually drinking the, the same one as uh, Frank was drinking earlier, so the double maturation. Um, and very thanks to him, he, he shared it with us, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the original. Okay. Yes, John is having a, a drum that I sent uh, about 20 bloggers back uh, 
Well, seven years ago, I was um, uh, when it was the first, the third birthday of my blog. So I organized a, a French whiskey tasting, and uh, two of the drums came from the Armoric, from the Armoric distillery. So we now have one question, Frank. Where was mine? <laughs> I think I didn't know you at the time. Maybe you seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, maybe um, the blog will turn 10 uh, in October, so uh, I'll right. try to, to manage uh, something. Uh, yeah, maybe we can do to have a special 10 year anniversary. Congratulations, from <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Frank, that, that works out quite well because I think mine turns five in August. So Ooh, pretty close. Yeah, we, we could we could host something between us. How about uh, English versus French? <laughs> yeah, mine yeah. will turn one in. Uh, so it's not right. history, yes, but <laughs> <laughs> mine will turn one in August. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can organize a birth uh, birthday tour in you know at the distillery. Sure, uh, and uh, I can host a few people at home. I'm only like. Uh, less than a, an hour and a half drive uh, from you so I, I can host a, a couple pers a couple people the How nicest been... ones so i'll let you choose among you among you <laughs> so how is the lockdown That's going to be a dilemma you, sorry, sorry. how is the lockdown affecting you at the moment uh, i i presume you're still producing how you are and is production yeah. stopped yeah, yeah. We've, decided, we def we've decided to continue producing um because you know it's it's just uh, one guy distilling, yeah. uh, so there's no contact. Uh, but the sales uh, in April were down by eighty yeah. percent. Uh, you know we are hardly selling anything. Uh, all the most of the retailers they are closed. Uh, all the supermarkets are still open. Uh, but then in the supermarket, people tend to focus on the big brands uh, these days. Yeah. So our whiskeys there are not selling a lot. So yeah. I mean, it's 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 difficult. The 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 thing I expect is uh, if uh, things uh, get a little more quiet and uh, and um, in maybe late June, July, August, maybe people will go on holidays. Uh, especially they will. Especially the French will go. And if that works this way, then it might be it might be because uh, Brittany uh, relies a lot on uh, tourism. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And how do you find sort of obviously you just mentioned there that you know people are sort of going for the bigger brands generally in the um, supermarkets, but how do you generally find that the the, the sales normally compared to French to Scotch whiskey is is French still not really looked upon as a whiskey producing area, or is it uh, easy? For, uh, I mean, in terms of in, in terms of sales, uh, yeah, I think French whiskey is 0.7 percent of the whiskey market in France. So, I mean, we're still uh, virtually non-existent. Yeah, uh, but then. It's 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 growing, and uh, with more and more whiskey distilleries opening and uh, launching new new whiskies, then uh, I'm pretty sure in the future people might uh, might might want to you know try the the local whiskies as long as the quality is there that that should work. Uh, in Brittany, I mean specifically in Brittany, uh, there are some people who drink mostly uh, Britain whiskey. Uh, but obviously they're not, they're, they are not the majority. And then on export market, uh, I mean, here in France, we tend to believe that everyone is expecting, uh, is waiting for French whiskey to appear on the, on the world uh, market. But uh, I think in, in every country now you have distilleries. So uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see why uh, France would be, would, would become a major whiskey country uh, internationally. I, I, I don't really see why. So my, you know, my idea on that is that we will be one of the world whiskies uh, 
there's no reason France would become any, you know, bigger, I would say. Yeah. I mean, from the whiskey I'm tasting here, I'm, I'm very impressed, you know, and, and that's not just because we've got you on, it's, it, you. it's been sat here for about an hour and a half now, um, not because I don't want to drink it, but I like to let them open, and it, it, it is evolving quite nicely. Um, that there is a lot of flavours, there's a lot of aromas, and it, it's very well balanced. Yeah, the double maturation is is uh, really the whiskey that um, that helped us to you know uh, uh, appear on the whiskey scene uh, internationally. We with this uh, double maturation, we we were, we won the best European award uh, seven years ago at the World Whiskey Awards. So you know that was something very very important for the distillery, and uh, this whiskey is really the one that you know put Armoric on the on the map. Yeah. And what what are the um, age percentages for the double maturation? How long in bourbon, how long in sherry? Usually we, we I mean it always depends on the vatting, but uh, usually we try to make it three years in Britain oak and three years in uh, in, in sherry. Uh, that's that is our understanding of double maturation. So yeah. Two, uh, what, what's the makeup of the vatting, David? The, sorry? What's the makeup of the batting? Uh, how many bourbon barrels? How many sherry? Well, so it's a double on maturation, this, eh? No, on this one, it's, uh, it, it's really the... All the whiskey goes into the Britano cask and then yeah. into the sherry cask. So there's... Got it. Yeah. And so, so I think you just said there that it's obviously done in batches. How big a batch do you generally make with that then? Uh, Double maturation, usually we do maybe 5,000 bottles at once. Right, yeah. Uh, which is, uh, I mean, for us, it's a big batch. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, for, I mean, you are, I think you said earlier, so 160,000 litres on average. So, like I said, I, I'm sort of working for the English whiskey company and we, we only produce about 70,000 litres. So you're, you're a lot bigger than us. So a 5,000 litre, um, Batch, you know, it's still quite a decent sized batch for a distillery of that size. Yeah, yeah, it's the the thing is uh, we 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 also have the um, some armoix for the supermarket where uh, we do a slightly bigger uh, batches, but for uh, double maturation we try to do maybe three to four bottlings every year. Yeah. Uh, that, that's that's the idea. And I, I'm pretty sure, I think this is bottled at 46, is it? Yes, 46, yes. Uh, unchill filtered and uh, natural color. And was that something you determined at the very beginning that you would try and put things out at that um, sort of percentage? Or is it just this sort of, this double maturation one? No, uh, the, the thing is when I joined the company, uh, at that time, we were mostly selling in supermarket, and uh, and my father-in-law was uh, chill filtering, uh, putting a little bit of caramel, forty uh, percent. Uh, and then, uh, when I first uh, went to different whiskey shows, then I realized that uh, most of the whiskeys, uh, I would say, on maybe high high-end markets. Uh, they were all unchill filtered and, and uh, no coloring and 46. So I, I mean, it took me maybe six months to convince my father in law just to make a try. But then that's how that's how we came out with a double maturation. Yeah, because I'm not bad. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just looking down at sort of what's available here in the UK, and we've got your 14 year old. Uh, it looks like a single cask, the sherry cask, a yep. six-year-old single cask, and the Devron. Um, and, you know, everything there is 46% and above. So, um, like you say, I presume you have a car range into the, your local supermarkets that maybe are 40% then, and the rest is up there to stop the filter, uh, non-filtration and that. Yeah, we have two armoix for the, for the local supermarkets, which are chill filtered 40%. But then the whole range we have uh, for the retailers and the export markets, 
um, like double maturation, they're all unchilled filtered 46 yet. Yeah. That's brilliant, yeah. I think uh, if someone is interested by a single cask, I think I, I saw one uh, maybe at Master of Malt, and they still have a 2002 uh, vintage. There's, maybe there's actually vintage. two single casks. There's a, a 14 year old 2002. Yeah, that's and the a, one. And a six year old 2011. Yeah, and the uh, two thousand is uh, two thousand eleven uh, is matured in French oak from uh, the region of Allier. It's a French district, and um, I've organized a tasting of this one, including uh, two other French whiskies with friends uh, some weeks ago. Uh, and by far, <laughs> this one was the one everyone preferred. Uh, and and I guess it's cheap. I think from memory it's like sixty or sixty five pounds on most of malt, and there are two or three bottles left. And uh, is that the two thousand and two, Christoph? Uh, no, it's uh, the two thousand. Let, let me check. It's right behind me. Two thousand and eleven is sixty nine pound ninety five. Uh, the two thousand and two is eighty five pound, basically. No, I think it was the two thousand. 11, uh, da, 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 yeah, uh, so it would be this one, uh, 2011 French Oak. Uh, I think it was 60 something pounds. Uh, you, you can go for it blind, it's, uh, it's delicious. You Just either didn't have many friends around, Christoph, or you were stingy with the bars. <laughs> and <laughs> just a blasted other session. <laughs> Just, just on the on the French oak, um, the the kind of the the Breton uh, casks. Um, David, are you, are you kind of looking to um, try and and do more kind of um, Breton casks in, uh, as part of you know your sort of um, distillate character and kind of like sort of bringing up the you know, Brittany um, that kind of local connection. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's definitely something we're working on. We, uh, as I said earlier, we at first we wanted, I mean, we needed to kind of reassure people uh, that it tastes proper whiskey. Now people are expecting us to make something a little, you know, a little different, maybe a little more local. So that's that's the idea to, you know, make Armoig as Britain as possible. So in the future, yeah. we are really looking forward to, you know, uh, Buy more of these regional casks. The we have just a slight problem right now is that the cooper is retiring. Oh uh, no! <laughs> and it was technically it was a one man show because uh, and and not even full time. Uh, he was he's actually uh, cutting trees for the uh, the administration that run the forest in France. And he did that cooperage uh, only as a part-time job, and we are his only client. So right now, I mean, <laughs> right now, I mean, before the crisis, I was actually planning to um, take over the cooperage and uh, and uh, hire someone uh, yes. in, in, in the distillery to make a cask for us, and uh, maybe try to, you know. Um, uh, keep the know-how in, in Brittany and maybe maybe develop it because there are other uh, spirits producer in Brittany so we could you know sell them uh, some some Brittany oak cask uh, so this project is still in my mind but maybe for 2021. How yeah. sustainable is the oak in the area? How sorry? How sustainable is there plenty of oak to go at um, and I presume for every yeah. tree chopped down, you replanting or? Yeah, when, when, uh, when I discovered recently that the oldest administration in, in France was actually the administration that runs the forest. Uh, it dates back to the 17th century. Yeah. Um, and these guys, they're in charge of making sure that the, the, the forest is, is run um, sus sustainably. Sustainably, yeah. Uh, and uh, the the good thing about the the forest in Brittany is that they were uh, planted at a time where they needed a lot of wood for the um, uh, making uh, boats. 
So they have a lot of these oaks uh, growing in the in the Britain forest. So should be okay. Yeah, um, you're not, you know, buying a lot of uh, uh, of these casks. We don't need maybe not even more than sixty casks. That would be maybe five to five to ten trees. So it's yeah. a tree so much. Yeah, but my understanding is that they um, they kind of work with the oak uh, in, in the forest in kind of parcels, and they'll, they'll cut down one parcel of it and allow that to regrow and, and, and then sort of move on to the next one so that there's kind of always growth going on. And, and that the, um, I think, is, is the average age of the, the trees there sort of about 200 years old? No, the, the ones we use, um, I mean, the, 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 the deal we had with the Cooper was, was not uh, doing via parcels. Uh, he was actually selecting one tree in, in the forest and then maybe another one in the other part of the forest. Um, and most of these trees were between uh, 140 and 160 years old. Mm. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. And what size casks are you making out of the local oak then? Is it um, a wine style cask or is it a bourbon type cask? No, it's uh, 400 liters, which is a, a standard, oh, I mean, one of the standards in France. Right. Uh, so, so nearer a hog, well, even bigger than, so nearer near a sherry boat size then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. And it also helps uh, not to have too much oak in contact with the whiskey. Yeah. And how, how, how heavily are you charring then to do that? It's a, it's a medium uh, it's a medium char. It's not heavily charred like like the like they do in Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, it's medium char, and uh, we have a um, uh, experiment at the distillery uh, with uh, ten ten casks with all uh, time of charring and temperature of charring difference. So it's it's actually very very interesting to see mm. how charring and and the, the duration of the char is. Uh, um, impacting the the aromas, yeah. And on, go on. And on on the kind of charring, David, um, you sort of mentioned that uh, you wanted the that kind of distillate character to come through. Do, do you do you uh, do you find that you know a, a virgin European oak cast that you've kind of freshly charred is is, is maybe a bit too much for the spirit, or uh, you know do you maybe maybe kind of leave that for a for a blend and then actually look to use the refill for uh, Amaric or how do you usually do that? We use uh, we use both the first second and third fill of these uh, uh, French oak cask. Uh, the thing is the, the second might be the best I mean in terms mm. of uh, yeah. too powerful. Uh, the first one needs to stay long. That's why the Derven is usually uh, a little older uh, than, for example, the double maturation. Because, I mean, as it extracts a lot from the wood, it needs time to, you know, settle uh, in the whiskey. Uh, third fill is, uh, I, I don't, I, I won't say inactive, but uh, it doesn't bring a lot of aromas. And but it's always good to have them in the in the batch in the vatting, so that you it's it's not too woody i have a question for you david yep. um you are um releasing some uh, special editions for the distillery for example this one which was uh yep. from an oh, armenia yeah. cask and that was only sold in uh, cote d'armor in Brittany. Mm -hmm. um now you 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 made a, a special uh, edition for breast for breast, uh, and I think I saw it on your website. Is it available to buy from your website? Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a sad story. I would say uh, it's it's the first time ever Armoric makes a product under license. So um, actually, every four years in Brest, we have these um, maritime festival with all these very old ships uh, and boats from all over the world. So it, it's quite an event. It's really nice, uh, a nice, nice event. And um, 
last year I contacted them to, you know, uh, ask them if it was possible to maybe have Armoric uh, as the uh, official uh, whiskey for the for the for the festival. Festival. And I said yes. So <laughs> we bottled uh, 200, 2,000 bottles like this one with a with a special label that's based on the, um, the the poster made for the festival and uh, the problem is that it was supposed to happen in july so it's cancelled <laughs> so i have 2000 bottles uh, of this bottling and uh, for the moment i've sold maybe five of them <laughs> So they're, 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 available uh, they're available on the website. Uh, uh, we're, we're actually expecting uh, these guys to postpone the festival to maybe next year. And then we can, you know, sell the whiskey uh, next year. Uh, but it so doesn't... it would be breast 2021 then? Will you, will you change the label? Uh, no, actually, the funny thing is that it's not written 2020 on the label. Oh, okay. This is a good news. Also, they have, uh, they are, I mean, that's maybe a little uh, uh, local information, but uh, their main partner is Armorlux, which is a <laughs> fashion brand. And they usually do a lot of uh, clothes designed after the Brest 2020. So what they have decided to do is they will postpone it next year, but they will still call it Brest 2020. So that and all the branding is not lost. Okay. Can you, can you tell us a bit more about this bottling? Uh, what kind of maturation, what age or though you can tell, <laughs> or you can, you can try it. Tell us everything. <laughs> it's our first Madeira Finnish whiskey. Uh, uh, just a finish, so uh, not a full maturation like your uh, single cask uh, bottle for the shop. Then it, it, it's uh, it's more like a double maturation. So first, okay. it's a six and a half years uh, old whiskey, three years in ex bourbon cask, and then three and a half years in uh, Madeira cask. Um, the idea was that you know Madeira is known for uh, this uh, relationship with boats and sea and uh, and the maritime climate. So it kind of makes made sense to uh, uh, use this cask for this fatting. And it, it's, a, it's a nice, uh, it's a very nice whiskey. I'm the only one enjoying it right now, but. <laughs> uh, I was enjoying uh, another Madeira one uh, earlier before going to the 2011 one, but uh, if, it is, uh, if it is as good, yeah, and yeah, people have to try it and then they'll buy it. Yeah. Um, one question I was going to ask a little bit earlier, um, and it, it kind of almost went, uh, with the Brandy Cider, um, I know we sort of said that we, you, you already have whiskey in there. Um, what, what sort of age is it at the moment, and how long do you foresee that being matured in them casts before it becomes too much for it? Uh, I think... Right now, it has been maybe three years in the cask for the moment. Um, and um, yeah, for the moment, it's, it's, actually, it's actually very, very nice, very balanced. So I, I don't know when we, will, um, when we will bottle it. What, what we usually do is we leave the whiskey as long as we can. And uh, yep. it helps us to uh, to uh, um, see when is the maximum and yeah. we can always i mean if one cask is spoiled then we can always use it in in some other vattings but it helps us to design which which what is the maximum because if we start using armoric inside of brandy cask then we have unlimited supply almost because we have our we, we kind of make our own casks yeah and um with with the Brandy cider. Then, how long was that in cask previously to the whiskey going in? Uh, brandy is the minimum has to be in two years. Um, our range is usually around four years in cask, but this cask has been used for many many uh, uh, fillings. So 
it has been used for at least uh, 15 years in the in for cider brandy before being used for the for the whiskey all ah, right so it's it's that they're very matured cast then yeah, yeah. yeah. Has anybody uh, gone, gone Yeah, so yeah, uh, I'm not sure you are going for it, so I'll do, <laughs> I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> you know what's coming. Uh, no, so, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Don't uh, take uh, the brown uh, away from him, Christoph. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> okay, I'll not yet, on, not yet. I'll wait. <laughs> one, one question that we seem to be getting a lot of and it, it's kind of fitting especially with you being in france and the word sort of being based around the french wine but how do you see terroir in whiskey compared to wine and is it something you believe in obviously being a frenchman as well uh i was supposed to visit waterford distillery in ireland <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you should. They're lovely. Well, we we've actually put an invite, but um, they seem to be ignoring me at the moment. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, um, <laughs> I think if you look at the the terroir uh, only like uh, the how they think in the wine, then you're just looking at the how you grow the the barley or how you grow the. The vineyard, but uh, I think in the the terroir in whiskey is is much wider technically because uh, just the climate might be. Uh, I, I have absolutely no. I, I'm not sure about what I'm saying, but uh, the climate might be the first influence uh, on on the whiskey because uh, if you if you take a whiskey that's been matured for ten years, then for ten years the climate into which it has been matured influences its uh, aromas and tastes so it, the climate might be uh, might be more important uh, in terms of terroir in the whiskey than uh, where the cereal where the barley has been you know grown but then i mean if uh, if the waterford experiment uh, proves that uh, barley matured in different places makes a difference, then it would be very interesting to, you know, uh, dig into that and, 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 and dig a little further. Um, so do you is, think the word tewa applies or do you think it's more about provenance? Because obviously they're very similar, but they are a different terminology when you look at things. Um, I mean, my argument is that if it needs a scientist to tell, tell us that there's a difference, it, it, it shouldn't really, it, it's not applicable. If we can pick it up instantly ourselves, then to me, it's important. Yeah, I, I, I would actually, I quite agree with, with what you say. I mean, if, if it's only, uh, you know, science that can prove that there is a difference, then uh, I, I'm not sure it's it's really worth the the thing, but uh, I mean I tend to see terroir as uh, something much much bigger than just the soil, mm. you know. And uh, whether whether you call it provenance or terroir, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but then um, the soil is one element. Then the climate is another one. Then maybe the water is another uh, another yeah. element. Uh, the variety of the barley is another uh, element. There are so many different elements that you can play with. Uh, maybe provenance is is, uh, is 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 a little more accurate. Yeah. Because terroir is, is too maybe too linked to uh, the wine business and how the the, the grapes have been grown. Yeah. So. I, I, the thing is, we are uh, the um, our master blender at the distillery. Uh, he comes from the wine industry. He's a enologist, and uh, uh, we are uh, already planning some experiments on barley, uh, barley, barley yeah. and uh, let's see. Maybe no, I, th I think I think it is certainly something that can be looked at, and I think it's it's good to be. It's an extra little bit of information for those people that want it. I, and I totally get that side of it. The side I disagree with is telling us that you can tell the difference from a field that sits next to each other, especially when the production technique can be altered 
and that will that will alter the taste more than the barley coming from one field to another. Barley strain again is a different topic because barley we all know barley strains will give us something different, and mm. that, that can't be disputed neither. Um, and how it's how it's designed, how it's how it's farmed, and things like this is certainly. But my argument for the wine industry connection to the whiskey industry connection is your vines don't move year on year. They stay where they are. They, they're nurtured every year. It's the same land. It's the same. In theory, it's the same climate. And um, we know climate changes day on day. But in theory, it's the same climate. As you grow barley, it changes field to field every year. That field makeup changes every year because by the time you've ploughed it once or twice, it, it's changed everything. So to me, the connection is, is not about the terroir, it's about the provenance, it's about the people, it's about the distillation, it's about the production. And I just think the terminology in whiskey is, is wrong mm. to compare yeah. it to the wine industry. No, uh, I, I, I can understand why, uh, why you, you say that. And yeah, it, it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, uh, I've, I, I want to try it, you know, for myself. Yeah. Of course, when you look at it, you know, very, uh, um, you have two fields. Let's say uh, they are slightly different. You will grow barley on these two fields. Then you have the malting process that really changes everything. Uh, then you have uh, the well, fermentation is, is pretty much like in the wine or the beer, but then you have distillation that also changes quite a lot uh, all the elements the, uh, in, in, the, in the product. And then you have, uh, let's say, 10 years of maturation. So all these uh, different, I mean, different things that ha happens to the, to the grain, it makes a, you know, a lot of difference yeah. like this in the future and i mean in scotland they usually say that uh, the the maturation is 70 percent of the of the taste of the whiskey and uh, i tend to believe it's quite true uh, so it doesn't leave a lot for the terroir to express itself no well, i mean it's interesting to try yeah no i i agree i mean i i'm kind of of the thought process that i think 70 percent is probably too high um, because i think the the distillation and the and the you know the process of making whiskey has a far greater effect on whiskey than probably most people will adhere to but I, I certainly think it, it's almost a split between the production and the maturation with the barley i mean we all know the barley is important because there's only three ingredients but i suppose at the end of the day the most important thing is how it actually tastes. It doesn't matter about the toa, it doesn't matter about the process if the whiskey is rubbish. And again, it's what, what, uh, what do you expect from the whiskey is and, and from each uh, um, part of the process. If, if it's only about uh, um, seeing how much each part of the process is changing uh, the, um, the the atoms and the molecules, then again, it, you have to need you have to have a scientist with you to mm. make the difference. So, is it worth the the try? I don't know. No, I mean I suppose the 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 thing we've got to look at as well is we we still don't fully understand how the wood affects the whiskey anyway. Um, we're still you know I mean look how long it's been matured in oak cast and we still don't know exactly what happens and and why every cask has a difference on the whiskey itself so i think until we find that out we're never going to know fully how much the barley has the effect on on the process because i mean it's like my argument with waterford is well how do we know at the end product what flavors have come from the cask and what flavors have come from the barley because we don't understand what you know we don't know what the cask is going to give us in the long run anyway Hmm. Yeah, that, no, that's true. That's true. And, and the, 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 the last the last element might be also that terroir is a very, very uh, French notion. Yeah. And I, I don't know if everyone wants to really use this uh, complicated and, uh, you know, very French notion. 
I mean, I know, I know one of the members of the group, um, Ed. He's he's quite keen on the on the Toa. Um, we've had many a discussion over this, um, and you know, the, the rest of the group kind of know my stance as well. But I, I get where Ed wants to come from in the sense of it, it's about the knowledge. You know, it, it's nice to know that it's come from a particular soil type, maybe. Um, whether we need to know where, where, which field it's come from, I don't know. But I suppose it's like me, I want to know the cast number. I want to know the cast makeup, the, the, the type of oak. And, yeah. you know, some people want to go deeper than that. I, I think the main point is about, you know, the transparency on what you do and yeah. how you get what you get. Because, uh, to be honest, you have a lot of these guys from Bordeaux who will talk day in, day out about the terroir. But then... They use um, um, yeast, but they uh, for the fermentation they had yeah. spe specific yeasts. And if you use one strain or the other, then you change completely your yeah. wine profile. So where is the terroir when you start using uh, exogen yeasts? Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's it, really. It's like you know, the terroir is, is is something that in you know in the wine industry is is a given. You know, it's it's not scientifically proven. Um, you know, it, it's just something that um, everyone accepts, uh, and and everyone kind of goes along and 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 you know accepts that this is what it is. Um, and and I think that the Waterford thing is interesting because they they're kind of trying to peer review it and trying to maybe show that um, it can be shown in in whiskey. Um, I mean, you know, I, I have I've been to Waterford and I, I've tasted new make samples, um, and and their you know one of their kind of main takeaways from it was that um, certain soil types gave certain um, kind of distillate characters uh, through through the the distillation process. And, and and certainly, you know, from from what I was able to taste, you you could see uh, where you know there were barley strains that were similar but matured in different places and 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 tasted differently. Um, I I don't think necessarily whether you know their argument is that that continues into whiskey once you start maturing it. Um, I think uh, you know the kind of marketing team of of maybe push the kind of terroir angle uh, a bit. Go on, say it, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, say it. <laughs> Go on. Um, yeah, and, and I think I think because of that, people, you know, as, as you've kind of said, David, have, um, have forgotten about, you know, the, one of the, the real points about this is it is transparency and it is traceability. And, and certainly it, there seems to be a big drive uh, sort of in the Irish whiskey industry, which is obviously really kind of rejuvenating itself and people are talking about how you know it'd be great if uh, distilleries used Irish barley and um, obviously that's not going to be workable for you know for for many distilleries and everyone knows that distilleries across the world use barley from different parts of the world but certainly um, you know and this is kind of something that Soren touched on I really enjoy that story and that provenance and and you know if, if someone produces a um uh you know a, a whiskey that that is made from local barley that that appeals to me i i like that i like that kind of romanticism yeah i mean that that's one thing ed and and i, I like the the idea of saying that a bit like brocladi do um this is a certain type of barley and this is a certain type of barley this, this is grown in, the, say, the northern part of Scotland. This is the southern. And I get that type of, of difference. Um, and, you know, the, the use of, of different strains, I think that's brilliant. Um, I think where it breaks down, and you kind of almost touched on it there, Ed, is, is the, the, the information coming out of Waterford so far is different from the marketing team to the actual people who are working there. We are getting two different stories, and that is the that's the problem behind this. I don't think they've all got the story together to be given as the information that that makes it make sense. 
Yeah, that's why I wanted to go there and see for myself what they were doing and how they were doing it because a lot of uh, process of processes uh, can you know change the way of understanding terroir, I, I guess. So yeah, and uh, so leading on from the terroir, you you almost sort of went into it earlier, David, uh, as we started this um, yeast. How much experimentation have you done with yeast? Um, do you look at different things all the time or are you now set and that's it? Uh, actually, 10 days ago, there was an um, internship that was supposed to start at the distillery uh, with someone uh, working in microbiology to um, you know, make a lot of experiments on different yeasts. Uh, unfortunately, it's not gonna happen now, but um, it was our first step in that in that field. Um, for the moment, we use very very standard yeast. Uh, one is Mori yeast, like most of the Scottish distillery, and another one is uh, is from Fermont yeast, and it brings a lot of uh, these fruity aromas. But then um, I would I would like to try uh, working with a you know a local yeast that would be. That would be very interesting, but I don't know how, if it's possible, if it's, you know, easy. And, um, and in the end, if it makes a difference for, uh, you know, general people, it will obviously make a difference for us. But uh, just like you said that if you need a scientist to tell the difference, it's, it's, it's the same for, uh, you know, general people. If you need a professional, to tell you the difference between two whiskeys, then is it worth the, I mean, it, it can be interesting just for, you know, curiosity, but yeah. then. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I, I kind of sort of, with um, Waterford, kind of sort of draw parallels with, with what you guys are doing in that they haven't experimented with yeast because they basically want to standardize that process so that the um, you know that that distillate character kind of comes through, and if you were to start playing with yeast, I mean I know they have a very long fermentation time that they've obviously settled on, but they've not settled on like a particular custom strain of yeast or anything like that because they just want to run things for long enough to see you know what what the kind of distillate character is, and I guess with you guys kind of saying that you wanted to. Um, have that character come through if you started experimenting with the yeast then that might add something extra to it that um, would mean that it would maybe mask what you were trying to achieve. Mm. It, it, it would change the character of the whiskey for sure. Uh, the thing is if, 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 if it makes it even more like what we want to have then it's good. If it changes and uh, it makes a completely different whiskey then Let's stick to what we do right now. What, what I'm going to do now, we're just going to ask this final question, then I'm going to stop the recording, um, because if we're going to get onto Tewa, then it's kind of taken away from what you've come to discuss. But before we do stop the recording on this conversation, can you, you know, what, what bar, uh, barley are you using? What strains are you using over there? Well, the, 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 variety. the strain of the barley. Uh, the strain is called... Um... Prestige. 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 And, and it's 100% prestige, you're not using any others, yeah. No, right right now it's 100% prestige. Yeah. We, we are looking at what they use in Scotland and uh, uh, we are trying to find some to, you know, do some experiments also in France. Uh, the thing is, uh, we, we distill uh, only um, organic barley for the past few years. Yeah. So it's hard to find a standard strain in organic, uh, uh, I mean, certified organic. So it's not that easy to, but I mean, Prestige is the one we've been using for a few years. So. Right. Has anybody got any questions other than Tawa? No, are we all good? Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Go yeah, go on. Hi, um, I was going to ask um, about your fermentation times. I wasn't sure if you spoke about this before I joined. No, no, no. Uh, no? 
Fermentation time is uh, four to five days, usually. And I've got a, another question. Um, you're also uh, at the distillery, you're also making uh, beer. Mm -hmm. You sell beer, your own beer. Um, do you use or are you planning to use this beer as a, a distillation experiment or uh, anything? Like, uh, like uh, for example, um, what they do in Alsace, you know, uh, beer spirits. Are you planning to, to make some or no? No, uh, I, I know what you mean, yeah, distilled beer. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not too, too fond of that. Uh, beer and whiskey are good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Follow up on that beer one. Do you, then, do you put, have you put any of the beer in casks that you then use to mature the whiskey in? Yeah, there's another. There's a, a, a brewery uh, not far from the distillery, and they've been uh, uh, lending some whiskey cask from us. So they returned the cask, uh, you know, soaked with beer. So we have, uh, I think, twenty of these casks maturing right now. Let's see. Anybody else? No? Right then, so uh, for this first part then, uh, David, I'll say, and this is going to sound really bad, but uh, merci beaucoup. Um, <laughs> my French is terrible. Um, it must have been merci bad. Everybody's laughing. <laughs> merci beaucoup, David. Yeah, so merci beaucoup. Much appreciated. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.